Hello there. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining us this afternoon or this evening, I should say, depending on where you are. And uh, so what we'd like to do this evening is uh, do an update from the last time when we had just released the RSAT and bring us up to uh, returning to sports and the update that uh, the uh, task group has put together. Um, during the talk tonight, this, uh, this afternoon, we will be um, asking you if you have questions to put them in the Q&A. And uh, once we're finished, we will answer those as, try to go through as many of those as we can. Um, joining me this afternoon or this evening is uh, Dr. Mike Wilkinson, who, uh, as we all know, will carry the load of this and I will just be along for the ride. So um, what we're going to look at this afternoon or this evening is um, looking at the RSAT and then also the newer club risk assessment tool, uh, review the high performance sport framework that has been put together with the SMAC group as well as OTP, COC and CPC. We're gonna talk a bit about testing, um, travel and self-isolation guidelines, uh, the gradual relaxation of the lockdown and return to sport, and then get into some more sport specific guidelines. Uh, there was some questions last time and we've had a few that have come through about masks. So we'll talk a bit about that, uh, an update on vulnerable populations, and then we'll try and spend a reasonable amount of time at the end looking at return to sport post infection. So I'm gonna kick it off first with Dr. Wilkinson who will talk to us a bit about the risk tool. Thanks, Andy, and hi, everyone. Um, here we are still in front of exactly the same picture that we started off on March 13th, I think. Um, and it seems like years ago. So the, the risk assessment tool, the RSAT, um, we went over in quite great detail last time, and that has remained the same. Um, the only thing that would have changed a lot on that, and we'll look at it in a little while, is actually the level of risk um, that automatically has um, been allocated within Canada. Um, Andy, can you do the next slide? I get to tell Andy what to do the whole time now. So that, as you know, um, came out of the high-performance sport framework, which is really a fairly lengthy document, but at the high level of the return to sport and gave it quite a few um, parameters and guidance, um, guidelines essentially for sports in order to um, make decisions on how to plan for returning to training. And that linked in with the risk assessment tool, which we then took the risk assessment tool and made it a lot more sport specific. So the original tool was fairly high level and we made it so that sports could actually make it specific for their um, location, their size, clubs, risks, etc. And that has been posted along with um, the other tools on the CASM website as well as you can see them on the OTP site. And you know the thing with all of these is that we end up um, basically I think Andy's playing around and muting me or something there at the background because suddenly I went off. Um, Andy, can you go to slide five instead of backwards? So part of the, the um, framework was talking about testing and within the testing, we've looked fairly closely at, at the Sport Med Advisory Committee and that, as you know, includes the CMOs from the four major sports institutes, Andy, myself, um, Bob McCormack, and um, it's chaired by Andy Van Newtengen at OTP. And we went through fairly vigorous discussions on testing and testing protocols. Um, as you know, I'll put the next slide up there, Andy. The testing in Canada, um, there is no role and this has been confirmed through public health and our discussions with public health no scientifically based role for testing asymptomatic athletes and staff as a screening measure 
Um, and I want to emphasize that. And in fact, in our discussions with the um, COVID advisory committee, the federal advisory committee, um, they've asked us to please continue to work in that manner. Um, what we are seeing is in a lot of the professional leagues and, and in the professional sports, you've seen a lot of positives coming up from their screening. And for the Canadian public health system, they're saying, look, unless you have contact, close contact, or unless you have symptoms, we are not recommending testing. And I think we joked a few weeks ago or in, in one of the calls we've been on, that um, the politicians go the other way and say, well, if you're worried, come and get tested. And I think that's from our friends in Ontario. Um, and really the, the just is looking at the, the, the symptoms and quarantine until you, the results are available. And then you may retest if you are fairly worried about the COVID. And I think that the, the basics to this is essentially we really all need to ensure that anybody who is symptomatic in any way does not enter the training environment. It's the same as in the, in the work environment. Um, they don't come into the center and that they actually need to agree to this prior to starting their training. Um, obviously, there's a lot of protocols and what happens with positive tests. And you go down the, the um, public health protocols for this and one of the things that we are stating is, is having to be done is that anybody coming into the training center you need to document the times that they're coming in and have their contact details so you can do very rapid contact tracing um, and if um, I think the stat that was given yesterday by public health officers was if we can trace at the moment, they're tracing 97% of cases in BC within 48 hours. If you can get that quickly, you can contain most of the outbreaks. But what will happen is that the team training is going to be suspended. And I know that this is a discussion that's ongoing amongst the professional leagues trying to get going, is if they have one positive, what does that do the rest of the team? Um, in the high-performance sport, we're saying that you can resume team training, A, when public health says you can, as um, they have the overriding ability to say go or no go, and that all team members are either then asymptomatic or have been so for 14 days after quarantine, or one tests them as close contacts. Here's the next um, slide there, Andy, and I'll hand this one over to you. Thanks. So I... At the SMAC group, we also were asked, partially by teams that were looking at traveling, and so they were thinking, okay, can we move from an area of high COVID to an area of lower COVID? Could we move, um, could we go as a group and train in from being in Calgary and go over into BC and do some traveling? And so uh, we looked at all of the provincial guidelines, and, uh, you know, the one thing I will say, and, you know, you'll see some differences from what we presented back in March, because this is really a moving target. And, you know, as, as late as probably yesterday and early today, we've gotten more information from this. So, you know, what we think is good one day does alter. Um, public health are constantly updating and politicians are also making changes whether they be based on what their public health authority or if they're based on political reasons and economic reasons is, is a debatable but they are changing daily so this is a table and it's uh, once again it's found on the otp site and um, as well it has been published in the SMAC updates that come out every uh, two weeks and looks at the different um, provinces International travel basically across the country is 14 days. If you come back anywhere outside of Canada, um, unless you are a professional athlete, which some, um, some of the federal governments, they've gone to the federal government, such as the NHL, and said, can we get away with less than 14 days uh, isolation? And they are granting that to some groups. But uh, um, interprovincial is very, very variable. Um, Alberta has none. Um, some 
have said that uh, LBC was 14 days. And in fact, they changed that, uh, I believe it was yesterday, to say that uh, they no longer require um, someone from Ontario or someone from Alberta to quarantine for 14 days. And because they want to have BC open for visitors and for their tourism. Um, the East Coast, New Brunswick, Newfoundland, um, Nova Scotia and PEI are forming one big bubble and uh, anyone from any of those provinces can travel within those provinces. Um, yet, if you're from Ontario or Quebec, you still have to uh, apply, especially going to uh, places like PEI, to get them to give you permission to come to visit. Um, once again, Quebec, uh, there was some local um, restrictions, mainly from Northern Quebec, and uh, that subsequently has been dropped. So what we do try and tell people is to um, check the links uh, and check them frequently. And uh, you, know, you can make a plan and think you may have to go there, but obviously if you can drop that, that's a lot, uh, that's a great benefit for teams because um, they can bring in athletes from different parts of the country together and not have to self-isolate for, for a full 14 days and the costs as well as the time commitment for the athletes is quite significant. So when we look at the, the framework, we look at the training environment. Um, we then go through the RSAT, the risk assessment, mitigation facts, strategies, and then modify those and then make a decision whether the athletes can return. Sorry, I don't know why it goes backwards. Um, and I just would like to mention at this point that this, uh, the RSAT as well as the club one has been adopted by not only um, sports within Canada, but also many international groups um, across the world uh, looking at whether they be sport specific or um, in within their country. So it's a, a testament to the work that was done by the uh, SMAC group. So this slide I put up basically to talk about, you know, when we talk to athletes, right now we've been in that sort of area where we're in zone one. We, we were um, just doing training. It was really just, there were a lot of restrictions. Those restrictions are starting to be eased. And as they start to get ease, we go back into, in, into group two, where we're going to be having camps, regional competitions, and um, allowing people to move within the, within the nation. Um, as we get into group three, and this is going to be a big jump, because of course our, our closest uh, neighbor to the south has a very different approach to COVID, and they have also had a very different uh, results, especially but within some states. Um, so that's going to be a big jump for within when we go from just within Canada to across the borders. Um, transcontinental and bigger competitions will go. Um, they may require some quarantines, uh, but right now that that is also being debated as. Um, once again, countries try to get back going um, and they want to host events and they want to get sports and things back going, uh, going again. And then by the time we get down to no restrictions, normal travel or the new normal as everyone's calling it with no crowd restrictions, um, basically I, I put the needle there to emphasize that we may be looking at immunization at that point, but we don't know. Um, whether that's going to be effective, whether that's going to be developed, and certainly no timeline for that. Uh, I'm going to pass over back or back over to Mike to talk about some statistics in Canada at this point in time. Hi, thanks, Andy. And yeah, no, no COVID talk is is um, complete without stats, I'm afraid, and I'm sort of tired of looking at all these and tired of reporting them, but. The reason I put these up is um, it'll become pertinent as we look at the return to training and return to sport and some of the recommendations and the um, basically the differences in recommendations between provinces, jurisdictions, national, international and federations. 
And I think the, the important thing on this, this slide is really looking at the number of um, active cases as opposed to the recovered cases, and, and that's the, the box on the right, um, where we can see that most of Canada we're over 80% recovered. And the, obviously the province that's at 50% is Quebec. And that does determine your risk analysis and your risk assessment when you're looking at return to training and, and um, teams getting back together. Um, obviously, this, this is the latest weekly um, analysis and report that's available as of a few hours ago. Um, and as you can see, it's already out of date because it's almost a week old and it was produced on the 19th of June. So those figures are up to the week of 17th of June. And we've seen since all the, um, the protests and the gatherings that our um, new reported cases, certainly out west, are increasing. Um, but um, at, a, at still what is a low rate. And can I have the next slide, please, Andy? So the important thing here is, is the WHO in their recommendations looks at the risk of transmission in the community. And if you look at the column with age standardized incidents, um, you'll, you'll notice that every single province or territory in Canada is basically below 15. Um, and the WHO will classify anything below 20 per 100,000 per week as low risk. So I think in, in this entire conversation, we do need to um, keep it in mind that in Canada, despite what we are seeing and despite the severity of this, we are still considered by WHO classifications as low risk. And that can speak to why some of the restrictions are being lifted as we have sort of um, flattened the curve and prepared for this. Um, next slide, Andy. And I think the reason I put this up is that we, we're in a constant tug of war. So in, in Canada, we have um, a two meter social distancing rule, and the, which may or may not be enough. If you look at some of the research that's coming out recently, where they're actually talking of it, perhaps we need to have three meters and some are saying, well, one meter. And so all of this is based on previous experiences and given that COVID is novel, obviously we don't know a lot about it. This um, table is out of the FISA return to training um, recommendations. And just if you click enter there, Andy, um, you can see that WHO will classify less than 20 cases per 100,000 in the last seven days, which is every province and territory in Canada, as saying that the WHO recommended distance is one meter. Meanwhile, we are constantly being told two meters. And so it does bring into question as to how do we get teams back playing or training in close proximity. Um, and in discussions with the advisory committee, um, we're looking at ways of being able to minimize that gap. And I know that in Nova Scotia, I think last Thursday it was, they suddenly said, okay, well, con contact sport is okay um, without any other preamble or warning. And so we're having to manage that across different teams. Can I have the next slide, Andy? The other thing we face is that every single federation, team, um, country has come up with their own recommendations. And some of them are. Um, very general and others such as the um, the world rugby one are extremely specific and i was on a call just earlier in the week with with rugby and they got the lab in belgium that had done the modeling you would have seen very early on in COVID. there was a a paper that was put out um looking at airflow on running and cycling and saying that, well, if you're, if you're cycling, you have to be more than 10 meters at, I think it was at 20 kilometers an hour with no wind. They actually got that group to do mathematical modeling of respiratory droplet transmission in a scrum. And I was quite surprised by how little they said there was, um, because anybody who's watched or played rugby will know that there's an extremely large amount of, 
of hot air going on in that in that scrum. So I think the reason for this is just to say, you know, although we give guidelines, each sport and each federation is going to have their own requirements. And that is going to be different both nationally and internationally. And they, some of them are requiring um, testing prior to entering any competition, which again, in Canada is against what our public health are recommending, but we're in discussions with them in order to be able to expedite that for teams that are going to be going over to Europe for some of the winter teams for their training and when competition allows later in the year. Next slide, Dan. I think we're back to me now. Um, so the other thing I just want to mention, uh, I'm just gonna go back for a second, is if you're involved in sport um, and you are involved in a certain team, there are lots of resources out there. Swimming Canada has put out an excellent document with relation to open water as well as pool swimming, um, canoe kayak. Um, so there are lots of both national as well as international, very much based on the same criteria. But I just uh, want to encourage people if they are specifically looking at a certain sport, um, whether you're at a university, you may have to look up several of these but there are a lot of really good resources that are well thought out, well written, um, that are out there. And I just uh, want to encourage people. I mean, obviously we can go through every sport in every way. Um, and I know that the Australians put out a, a, a huge document, um, but really when they, you get right down to it, they put like a paragraph on each sport. Um, and some of these are quite detailed and quite well thought out in terms of scrums and uh, ball and does the ball need to be with volleyball what can can they block and all those kind of different uh, aspects which they've looked at um, in expert provider groups so just a plug for looking up so um, it seems to be the uh, the fashion statement of 2020 is going to be the mask um, uh, wouldn't be a, a, Mike wouldn't have a presentation without Rowing Canada being well represented, and these are a couple of his athletes that are sprouting the uh, the Rowing Canada masks. Um, and so, you know, obviously we all know that in Canada, the beginning of COVID, there was a no, you don't need a mask, don't wear one, and that has morphed into um, everyone wearing one. Um, recommendations from the provincial as well as federal government to wear them um, and then of course that has also gotten into sport where um, I've seen people out running and wearing in this case a, a surgical mask uh, procedure mask as well as um, many cloth coverings and so uh, we just thought we would talk about that for a minute um, obviously, I don't have to tell anyone on this call that a mask is not a mask and it is not an N95 mask. So, um, as we all know, the reason for the mask is not to prevent getting COVID, uh, although you will see some individuals who are fully kitted out in spacesuits thinking that's what they're doing. Um, but it is there to prevent you from coughing, spitting, um, and breathing and giving other individuals um, droplets that they may, that may, may uh, get COVID from. Uh, we do know that the mask does decrease airflow um, and there's some increased resistance. So people with uh, respiratory diseases such as COPD, cystic fibrosis, shouldn't be wearing a mask and, and probably wouldn't tolerate a mask. Uh, we do know that with uh, high intensity, um, a lot of athletes will feel dizzy and some can even get to the point of fainting. And so the recommendation is not to be, has been not to wear a mask um, for training. There are some people who, uh, and you'll probably have seen this in sort of a, a fad, fad that went for a while, kind of died out. Um, people were wearing masks to mimic um, high altitude training um, to get themselves uh, to, to build resistance. Um, but really for the normal sports and the normal individuals, um, we don't recommend it. And the other thing I always want to, to make sure that people know is that obviously you sweat. 
especially if you're in certain parts of Canada the last week or two where it's been 40 degrees during the day and sweat will decrease the usefulness of a mask. The other thing is it does is it makes the mask slide around and move around, which means you touch your face more and that increase your risk. And the last thing we do know is that uh, individuals who have a mask on have a false sense of security in the fact that they think, well, I've got my mask on. I don't need to keep my two meters away. I don't need to pass. Um, I can run closer to my buddy um, or in small groups. So I, for the most part, uh, we have recommended against masks uh, for training. Uh, we'll continue to adhere to the recommendations of the federal government in terms of wearing them for day-to-day -day, uh, activities. Uh, this is the original slide with a slight alteration um, in terms of medical risks. And we just once again wanted to go over that. Um, the age, sorry about that. The age has been um, debated, whether it's 65 or 70, um, and so the more recent publications have looked at over 70. Um, another group that has been added to the medical risk is obesity, and I think that's uh, not in the athletic population, but certainly in our day-to-day -day, um, uh, population, that's something to consider. I, if anyone hasn't read um, the Stanford's consensus statement for uh, rehabilitation, I would recommend it, especially if you're dealing with vulnerable populations. Um, they talk about both the pulmonary, the cardiac, the neurological, um, psychological, which I, I, we, I must admit in the last, the first talk that we give, we didn't talk about very much. And I do think it's important to, it is a large component of it. Um, we do have a lot of individuals that have been, um, have a lot of issues with the isolation, with catching or someone they know catching COVID, um, a death in the family, which of course the normal, uh, you can't go to funerals, you can't be with your family and, and gather to any great degree, um, as well as the loss of a season. Some of them has cost them their career because they're at the end and they just can't hold on for another year to get to the, to the games the next year. Um, certainly in our youth sports athletes, there's a lot of them that are looking at potentially losing their uh, final year of eligibility or not losing the eligibility, but really they're going to be done school. So would they come back for another year just to play the sport or maybe it's their draft year and things something like that. So uh, it's, a, it's a huge component and I think we all have to be very aware of that and to make sure that um, as we do to get back athletes back into sports and teams start uh, the loss of the sport team to being together, being part of the team is also important. Um, MSK and rheumatological, there are some um, there are some complications that have occurred from COVID, and then the medicals uh, to look through those. So if, I think it's a very good paper. Um, I recommend it. You know, as I say, we couldn't go through the whole thing today, but I think it's uh, it's worthwhile having a look at. Um, one last thing I wanted to say about vulnerable populations, and I guess this is my parasports little um, two cents worth, is to say that you know. Uh, there's a natural a set, a sort of assumption when people are talking about para-athletes uh, is that there are a vulnerable population, but there, there is no great evidence that unless you have one of the medical illnesses um, such as this, which can occur, you know, there's lots of able-bodied athletes that have asthma and sometimes quite significant asthma or have cardiovascular disease, um, that they're at higher risk. So just because you're a para-athlete doesn't mean you're at a higher risk. Um, and that's important, especially as we look at return to sport and returning people to the, uh, the, the uh, competition and the training venues. Um, the one, one thing leading into that I would like to say is that um, I just wanted to give a, a shout out for the uh, last uh, para and adaptive sport webinar, which is uh, day after Canada Day. Um, and we will be talking about nutrition in, para, in the para athlete, as well as um, toolkits and management of strategies of, of wounds. And so if you haven't uh, checked any of these out, this would be a very good one. 
and uh, it's been uh, quite well received. So just uh, I want to give that a plug and uh, continue along the uh, the uh, webinar uh, success that Chasm has had. And now I'm going to turn it over to Mike, and we're going to talk about uh, an area which I think a lot of people have shown a lot of interest in. Hi, thanks, Andy. And um, two things before I get going on this section. Um, before you all start shouting at me for having the athletes in rowing wearing masks, that was so that they could get onto the water without in having infecting anybody else. Once they're on the water and training, they take the masks off. So we'll put that one out there. And I also never thought that I'd be on a talk with an orthopedic surgeon speaking more about something about musculoskeletal injuries and, and things. So um, it's, thanks, Andy. So, you know, returning to training and competition has become um, a, a large area of debate and discussion around the world, obviously. Um, and I'm going to st state right from the start that every single one of these are expert opinions at best. And some of them are, are great consensus statements and have extremely well-respected and, and great people on them with a lot of experience. But at best, we do not have enough data in athletes to actually be making um, level one decisions. However, um, the other part that most of these recommendations come out with is that they seem to be from specific expert groups and and we're joking earlier before this talk in that there's a large number of them appear to be from um, cardiologists and i'm not sure if the cardiologists just have a lot of time at the moment or what but certainly at least four of the bigger ones and the earlier ones that came out were from cardiology groups um, based in north america and europe as well as i saw one out of australia as well um, Big thing with COVID, as we, as we know, as we, we see more of it, it is a multi-system disease. And so we need to respect the impact on all the systems from COVID. And, and as we know with exercise, um, the requirement of all those systems in order to perform at the top level is, is going to be essential. I think we talk in, in three different groups um, when we return into sport. And it's, it's you know, those that have not had any contact with COVID, they're asymptomatic, they're absolutely fine. And how do you return them back safely while minimizing the non-COVID injuries? And this is going to be a very interesting thing to see as, as teams get back and we're looking at rates of return to pre-COVID training levels trying to peak either for qualification events coming up in the, hopefully, in the winter and the spring, or for the Tokyo Games. Um, the other group that is, is fairly easy to deal with are the symptomatic athletes because essentially we end up shutting them down. Um, and the group that's taking up a lot of the discussion is those that are, have had an infection, may have very mild symptoms, or are asymptomatic. And how do we manage that group um, safely? Um, and the, the table on the right is really one of the early ones that came out. And it's the same as the return to sport guidelines that we've had previously of different phases and, and just how you exercise. But that's just to illustrate how, how things have changed since then. We'll have the next slide, Andy. And a lot of information on... A small area here but these were two of the earlier um, recommendations or I think the one by Bagish was actually an editorial and the one on the right by Bloch at all was in the German Journal of Sports Medicine and that was a group of cardiologists and respirologists and they do focus a lot on the investigations um, and if you note on the, on the right, they, they have a fairly good flow diagram, but the recommendations say no intensive sport for two weeks, no sport for two weeks, no sport for at least four weeks. Um, when you look into it, and I've spoken to, to the authors, there's not a lot of data behind that. This is looking at what they would recommend when somebody has had a pneumonia or somebody has had a uh, myocarditis. And 
part of the discussion as well, what's your definition of myocarditis and what percentage are going to have the myocarditis and what about the rest of the, of the symptoms. And, you know, for a lot of us, um, access to all of the investigations that they are recommending, including cardiac MRIs and um, the spirometry is not only difficult to get, but there is that debate about spirometry at the moment as to, first off, I challenge a lot of you to try and find a lab that's happy to do spirometry on somebody that has had COVID. Um, there's, as soon as you mention COVID, anything to do with any pulmonary machine seems to be a, um, a no-go for a lot of labs. But have the next slide, Andy. And so this is, this is developed and there was a, um, a paper put up by Stokes, an international journal where they, they were one of the first groups that actually started to look at a, at a graduated return to training and give some, some parameters on that, um, really looking at their symptoms and I know I think, I think in the earlier webinar we spoke about sort of the, the rate of returning to training and there's been quite a bit of debate about that rate and um, it really is focusing at the moment on individually monitoring athletes and you know it's really saying are there any red flags what are the restrictions on the athlete and how do we manage them and the very busy diagram on the right-hand side here is actually out of the, the group of seven, which is an interesting name for a group, but it's a, a group from the um, IOC and IPC Sports Medicine Commission. So it's headed by Martin Schwellenus, um, who's on the IOC um, Medical Commission. And I, I believe Wayne German from the IPC is on that. And really, they are going back to basics on this and saying, look, um, you know, not everybody has access to all those, the testing. Um, and basically you're going through an assessment of saying, are, where are they? Are they symptomatic? Is it mild? And is it safe for them to actually even consider going through? And they, if you look at the bottom left, um, if they go through a graduated submaximal test, once you've cleared them, um, that would be the way to be going. And they, they talk about using um, simple systems such as, I mean, almost every athlete now has a, has a heart rate monitor with Polo or a Strava or Training Peaks, but also rate of perceived exertion and relative intensity of exercise. And, and the concept of relative intensity is important because you're correlating the amount of exercise that they're actually doing compared to what they were doing prior to COVID or prior to the slowdown. And then looking at their response that you, in high performance sport, we've been able to monitor them and you can actually make some correlations to that. And obviously, um, if they have symptoms at, at a low level, then you take a step back and I'll, I'll go to the next slide, Andy. So this was a, um, a uh, I never remember if we call them a pictogram or a, um, a uh, just an infogram put out by Elliot and I mean the British Journal of Sports Medicine very recently and I think um, Chasm tweeted it out as well. But also looking at, at sort of what are some basic guidelines and they, they talk about 10 days from onset of symptoms, seven days symptom free and importantly without having to use any medication to control symptoms. And then you can start the graduated return and they have a um, six stage, almost seven stage return at each stage ranges between two days to a day, but in a stepwise manner, almost similar to how we have the graduated return to play after concussion and looking at parameters of increasing the cardiovascular resistance, in increasing the time and increasing the intensity. And they do stipulate that this is actually for um, aerobic type sport and not specifically to strength based sport. So there's another area that we would have to work on. Um, I think that I have covered most of what's under that, that general approach and except to, to alert you to a multi-center study that is going on through the IOC and I believe through IPC as well, the AWARE study, which is athletes with acute respiratory it should be an eye infection. Um, and 
that is actually targeting some of the COVID return. And what they're looking at is worldwide is what is the experience and what are some of the hard data that we can get on the actual impact of COVID. And I mean, we've seen the respiratory journals coming out of China, the impact of pulmonary function um, and cardiac function post COVID on, on patients. And you know, we don't have enough data on elite athletes. Um, everything is hearsay as to how hard they've been impacted or not. Um, and w there is a, a, a request for us to start considering actually helping and becoming part of that aware study, um, but early days yet. And I'll hand over the next slide to Andy. On mute. After 45,000 Zoom calls, you think you would know that. Um, this uh, is just basically a summary uh, to look over. We've talked about, um, we, we've been through the process of getting people prepared for sports resumption. A lot of it's education, um, educating the, the, the medical staff, the team, um, and the, really the sports. Um, we've looked at the training environments and we've agreed to the protocols if someone has a positive case. Um, we then have moved into different levels of activities and we talked about those the last time. Um, and I just wanted to take a second just to say, especially um, as you start to get your plan to come back, is to really almost go athlete by athlete. Now, that's easy for a, a team that has four or five or um, 10 or 12, let's such as a, a volleyball team, but um, obviously big teams like, like uh, football and rugby there, you, you have a lot more athletes. But I think you do have to look through. It's going to be fairly simple in a lot of cases, but you do have to look at vulnerable athletes um, as well as staff uh, as they get back into the training environment. And then not, to, and then not to just sort of get that initial screening. Oh, you're okay. Well, let's forget about it. We don't have to worry about it. You do have to monitor your, both your athletes as well as your staff. And once again, link back into if you do have a suspected case, how you're going to take care of that. So that's the end of the formal presentation. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. And um, we'll go back to uh, taking some questions. Get out of here. Yeah. So, um, see, there's a couple of questions uh, already that have been posted, and I encourage anyone that does have questions that they wanted to ask to put them into the uh, Q&A. The first comes from Scott Frazier, and is, is there a consensus or recommendation for PPP, PPE for first responders looking after teams as they return to training? Uh, and since I will, uh, I, I get to dole this out. I'll let Mike answer the first one. <laughs> I knew you were going to be doing that. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, there's no hard and fast rule on, on PPE for first responders. Um, and it depends obviously on the level of the requirement for first responders. And I'm assuming you're talking of guidance for looking after the teams, which it would be a case of what is your risk? Um, what is the sport and how, how much are you going to have to go out? So uh, I think in addition to the normal gloves that people would be wearing when going out onto the field, they, you would be prudent to be using a mask, but I certainly don't think you need to be wearing a full hazmat suit if the rest of the team you know has been screened. And I, I will go back to the fact that, uh, you know, all of this is built upon the basic parameters of monitoring your athletes or having daily screens of the athletes. And that doesn't mean daily examining of them, but doing the daily questionnaires, um, them monitoring their fevers, making sure that you keep on top of that so that you're able to mitigate the risk. All, all of this is based on minimizing the risk and how do we get sport back or athletes back safely. So I think, I'm not sure, Scott, if that answers your question, but in short, no, there is not a hard and fast rule. There are 
recommendations in each province through WorkSafe BC sometimes and through some of the local via sport in BC um, as to the requirement of using PPE when looking after athletes or being in the gym, etc. Okay, and the next question comes from Patrick Burdett, and he was wondering about whether there was real evidence that supports the graduated return of, of play levels. And um, I think that the answer to that is that at this point in time, we don't have a lot of evidence. Um, I believe that uh, um, they're expert opinions, and so people are tend to be going by that and gathering from uh, other um, experiences when they've had with uh, respiratory illnesses, et cetera. So um, I think that's basically what they're going by, but I, there is no level one, level two evidence that says uh, this level for this long, um, but they're just suggestions at this point in time. And the next one, I'm gonna go down, this is from Lee Schofield. You might have answered this. Um, have you come across any information on the distance between coaches, trainers, and athletes in the team sport environment when they are training? Um, and then as a follow-up to that, do they need to wear a mask? Um, so uh, once again, Mike, I get, to, or, yeah, I get to punt back and forth, so I'll let you have that one. Yeah, so um, the, apart from what has been Put up there from WHO and obviously the two meter rule that we are seeing. Um, I think what, what we need to understand is that the, the two meter rule is essentially for general unknown, uncontrolled exposure. And I'm sticking my neck out there a little bit because essentially with the team and the athletes that you're dealing with, you've screened them, um, you know them, and you know that they are generally reliable in what they're answering. And so, you know, we, we do have some guidelines, but I think with, with the way things are being relaxed, we are able to actually get less than two meter contact. And as we've seen some of the provinces in Nova, um, and I quoted Nova Scotia earlier, they're allowing close contact with groups of up to 10, I believe it is. And it varies across it. it it is incredible how variable the recommendations are from one province to another. So I think rule is number one, you've got to stick with the provincial regulations, but the other part of that is by mitigating the risks and showing that you have eliminated as many of the risk factors as possible, you are able to start doing closer coaching and, and closer contact. It's the same as we we now able to have physiotherapy, open and um, the all important spas and barbers, as you can see, Andy and I, neither of which have been to. Um, so I think that there is, all of this involves actually making an intelligent risk-based assessment and, and decision. Very good. Um, the next question from Bruce Davidson, uh, any comments on medical insurance implications for traveling teams? Uh, he had noted that cycling had posted today that CAPE will not cover COVID-related illnesses or issues. And, and I will tell you that this has been a huge issue. Um, obviously, uh, when COVID first started, the, the insurance companies were covering, but they pretty much all put a date on it. And as soon as uh, any travel that was booked after COVID was a known entity, uh, they were not covering. Um, I know that uh, one of the teams that I work with has just been in that process and they have gotten a, a separate rider that uh, will cover uh, both COVID as well as other infectious diseases so that those medical insurances are coming out, um, but it is a big issue for the national sports uh, and obviously um, more smaller sports or localized sports such as U sports will definitely have to have a look at that as time goes by because the, uh, the implication of course of you being down in the states or uh, in another country and being stuck there for a significant length of time if someone got ill never mind the medical aspects of the care 
um, could be quite significant. So it's something that uh, the task force has uh, looked at and is trying to continue to work with um, their suppliers of insurance to uh, try and get that coverage. But as of now, it's, uh, it is just in its infancy in terms of development. Um, let me see. Naveen had said, uh, we are recommending temperature checks for initial screening. And do we know false positive and negative rates of doing so? Um, and I'm going to give Mike a break. So I'll let I'll answer that one is that um, we do know that that temperature checks are very inaccurate. Um, uh, and that's, you know, not only individuals can uh, mask that, um, it depends on how you're going to do the temperature check, of course. A lot of places, the vast majority are using the forehead checks. Um, and the, you know, it's really, I think it's done more to make people feel better, but there's, it's not been found to be particularly useful. In fact, most places have gone more with just a screening process of symptomatology and abandoned the uh, temperatures. The other thing, of course, is that it's uh, essentially impossible to maintain a two meter distance unless you've got one heck of a long arm um, to, uh, to get the temperature done. So you are putting someone, unless you're gonna fully get them out in uh, PPE, you're, uh, that individual's for every person they come in contact with is, uh, is within the two meters. So, uh, or even the meter if we wanna to go to a lower degree. But uh, I think for the most part, that's a lot of, and, uh, um, my personal recommendation is that that wouldn't, I, we don't do it at our clinic and we haven't recommended it for our sports. I don't know if Mike, if you have any other opinions on that one. No, I, I agree. Um, I mean, we all know that you can manipulate a fever um, and that's why we have antipyretics. So anyone who is going to try and get through the system can do that. Um, we are not using temperature checks. We are going through the history. And essentially with, with the teams that have been involved in, we've actually had them sign an agreement that they, they understand that the importance of being honest in their questions and in maintaining a limit on the number of contacts that they are having outside of their training bubble or their training nodes, which is um, now expanding slightly but allowing them to understand that the only way we can control things is to control essentially what their exposure is and to minimize that by minimizing the number of people that they may be interacting with away from the training venue. So the next question I, I, is more of an opinion, so we'll maybe both chirp in on this is, what are your thoughts on with athletes coming from the US and going into a 14 day quarantine? Should we screen these athletes with testing uh, instead of a 14-day quarantine? And the example was the NHL, NBA, CFL, and U Sports. Um, so I'll let you start, Mike, and then I'll then I'll give my opinion if it's different. <laughs> <laughs> I think the first thing I'm going to ask is the press on this one and wanting to put this out on TV somewhere because that's the question they ask all the time. Um, and I'd, I'd probably defer to people like Winner. Um, that is involved in that on a daily basis. Um, you know, the, the public health regulations are a 14 day quarantine. And, you know, if you look at the risk and the, and the infection incidence and rate from the US, it is a risk for athletes to come from the US. Um, in, and obviously there's variants across the country into Canada and you are bringing either potentially a different strain but certainly a lot higher chance of, of um, contact into a region where we've actually managed to control things fairly well. And I know that there's a big discussion within the NHL and the NBA as to whether they want to quarantine or not. And we can go on all night on a debate about asymptomatic testing and the regularity of the testing and the sensitivity and false positives and negatives. So, Personally, um, I still think that the way the, the, the pandemic, I was going to say epidemic, pandemic is at the moment, I do think we need to adhere to that quarantine for international travel. And I know it is easing coming up, but 
Um, right now, where we are at the moment, I would be nervous to relax that with, especially coming in from um, the, the U.S. And I, just, I think we should just mention in this, uh, this, in this particular aspect, um, if we've said that there's not many athletes out there that have uh, had COVID for us to be able to see what kind of effects. And um, I guess we can thank uh, Florida really for uh, a uh, giving us a large number in the last couple of weeks uh, of athletes from different sports that will um, will be able to see some of the effects because uh, certainly you know you come from a hotbed like that and we know that there have been people going down to Florida um, and their risks are going high their numbers are going through the roof down there so um, yeah I, I I think that you know We've, we have been fairly strong saying that we don't think we should be testing asymptomatic individuals. We know that you probably have to do multiple tests. Um, and uh, so really, if you divide, you, by the time you go through those multiple tests over a period of whether it's five or seven or 10 days, um, you know, one could argue what, what, whether 14 days is the right number, if it's 10. Um, but I think uh, a period of, uh, quarantine is, is warranted. Um, next question I'm going to bring up is uh, for indoor sports, windows opened or closed? Um, uh, and our thoughts on that. And certainly we know that if you're outdoors, that, uh, that the risks are lower. And that's one of the main questions they ask um, in the, or the uh, risk factors. Um, and so we do, uh, windows open would be a better. Uh, we do know that in the nursing homes that had the worst outbreaks, there was very poor ventilation and that did contribute to the spread of the uh, uh, spread of COVID. So I think uh, my opinion would be, although I, I'm not sure that I could give you studies or a lot of uh, um, information on it, is that windows open would be a better option if at all possible. And uh, Margaret asked uh, about uh, what kind of pulmonary and cardiac effects are being seen post COVID. Um, Mike, maybe you can talk a little bit about that in terms of what they are seeing and what the cardiologists and the respirologists are, are concerned about in terms of ath uh, athletes or the general public going back to exercise. Yeah, so not, not being either a cardiologist or a respirologist type. I'm at great risk of putting my foot in it, but um, we are seeing um, a restrictive type pattern um, pulmonary wise with decreased um, vital capacity. And we are seeing some decrease in peak flow rate and um, oxygen transfer. Um, I did see a study recently and I, I just saw the abstract of, of actually decrease in um, oxygen transfer in post COVID. So not even when they're symptomatic on discharge. And so I think, you know, one of the big issues we, we may face is if you can see a 10% drop in your pulmonary functions um, in an elite athlete, that is huge. Um, and that has the potential of, of, of essentially almost being career ending in some of them. And we don't, obviously don't know how long that will last. Cardiac, we've seen um, decreased um, cardiac output. And we, um, I have heard a couple of, and again, it's anecdotal of um, some arrhythmia type issues, but we've seen um, myocarditis, post myocarditis and post um, pericarditis and then obviously there's been the um, throb increasing thromboembolisms both venous and um, arterial which is um, fairly unique. Um, Megan Maynard asked about uh, would it be recommended for staff and athletes to go through a mask donning and training um, and also as a resource that we can recommend and certainly uh, if you want to get in touch with us afterwards, I can give you some sites that we've used through our different sports to show. And for sure, staff um, and I think athletes, it's also a very reasonable thing to do to teach them how to put masks on and off properly. Uh, um, because that's, we do know that from the uh, Italian 
um, groups that that was one of the biggest areas where they that the poor technique that they used ended up causing a lot of uh, infections. So I th certainly uh, it would be a good thing to do and it should be part of that education that athletes get um, prior to starting restart of training. Um, I'm going to go over to the uh, chat side of things and just uh, go through a few questions on here. I have to, there's a few comments, so I just have to try and go through. Um, Tim Cregan asked if there was uh, guidelines on facility preparation and maintenance for preventative prevention of infection. And um, I think I would recommend that you go through the, uh, the, uh, facility or not the facility sorry the club um, information there was some links on that that did talk specifically about cleaning hard surfaces um, and uh, cleaning equipment that uh, that I know that we've used for our wheelchair uh, rugby um, specific uh, recommendations um, looking at that and then of course the CI the CSIs are all just opening up and they've gone through a quite an extensive uh, facility preparation and getting things back and how they're doing things within their gymnasiums, et cetera. Um, and once again, I think we could, uh, we could probably get you those. I know that I have them for uh, CSI Pacific, uh, the INS and CSI Ontario as well. So um, there was a, a comment uh, that, People may have seen that the CTSQ, the Quebec Corporate Athletic Therapist, has published the recommendations for field coverage and PPE. So uh, the, the question that we had, that would be a good way to, uh, um, to a good thing to sort of check out. Uh, and then I'm going to give Mike this one, <laughs> suggestions for pre-participation pre assessment, um, screen only and Personal, uh, personal uh, in a personal exam in athletes with red flags. Um, would you do EKGs? An athlete had had COVID prior to training, so maybe they come in. They told you that they had it back in April, and we're now in August, September, and they're they're coming back to the uh, to, to the sport. Yeah, I think that again in in. In any of these um, post-infection screening, I think it, it really depends on the severity that they had um, and what their um, tolerance is. And I'd, I do think it's pertinent to obviously do a, a pre-return assessment, and I would suggest doing a physical assessment if they have been um, asymptomatic for at least the 10 days, two weeks. And I or I think it's asymptomatic for seven days, sorry, but two weeks since onset at least. I, I would be very hesitant on letting someone come back to train if I had not assessed them. And in that assessment, it would be a, a case of, of whether you're doing the ECGs and what are the pulmonary implications or do you do it as a submaximal test and look at the effort. I think... Um, Again, it depends on the recommendation and the paper that you read. Um, if you read some of the cardiology papers, you're going to be doing um, cardiac MRIs on everybody that has had COVID. Um, I think that's too far on the other, on the one extreme, and on others they're saying, well, just simply let them start training and see how they do. And I think that's a bit too far on the other extreme. You know, the in-person exam, um, uh, I think, as as team physicians. I do think it's um, incumbent on us to actually examine the athletes um, post COVID before they return. And Andy, you may have a different opinion, but. Nope. I always agree with you. <laughs> um, uh, Sam, Sam, uh, thank you for the yes, uh, question. 144 square feet per person has been recommended for indoor training. And they want to know if we knew what the evidence based that recommendations on. I believe that was, came out of the uh, Danish paper that looked at uh, the particle spread, um, looking at the size of the particles. And we, do, we did have both the uh, athletics as well as the cycling um, sports scientists have a look at that Danish paper. And, and they, they thought, you know, certainly it's, it's theoretical, 
um, but it seemed to be fairly accurate in terms of what the science was good. I don't know, Mike, if you have any other comments upon that. I don't know that I've seen any other. It's funny because I came out very early on in the process, and I haven't seen anything real really since then. No, I I, I think the only thing I've seen since then is is some mitigations through ventilation and whether there's filtration and what the turnaround. Uh, of the um, ventilation is, but um, nothing more than that since then. So a um, couple questions about uh, athletes with vulnerabilities. Uh, when dealing with athletes with vulnerabilities such as asthma or diabetes, is it best to separate them into other groups for training? And I, I don't think that that's necessary. I think that um, what we've looked at in some of our athletes that do have um, maybe not asthma or diabetes, but other other sort of autoimmune things is we've said, you know, they're not going to be part of that first wave that we are going to let this process work its way out. Let that curve be flattened a bit as it has been in a lot of places and then gradually bring them back in. So um, it's not that we're saying they can't go back. Um, and I think that was the message that they kind of got when we first said that is, um, but to say, look, you just don't want to be that first person, you know, you want the system to be well developed and to gradually get things going um, and to wait until there are 14 days where there's no, you know, cases in the local environments and things like that to try and decrease their risk. What we're saying in those individuals is that if they get COVID, the, the chances of them having a more serious infection and complications of COVID are higher. So um, that's really what we're trying to emphasize with those particular groups. Um, and Mike, uh, I'll just, um, I knew I'd put my foot in it as an on cardiologist. So Jimmy <laughs> McKinney from BC Sports Cardiology sent us a note um, and basically we're emphasizing that in the B BJSM, they say um, consider an ECG. Um, if the athlete has had COVID and their symptoms relate to decreasing their performance upon return, then they do formally need to be assessed. And if the ECG is abnormal, then an echo is needed. Um, and then Sanjay Sharma in um, the UK was saying, first do a troponin level, and if the troponin is positive, then do an ECG with or without an echo. So as you can see, the cardiologists have some very specific parameters that they've been looking at um, where we are essentially on the front end of this and trying to figure out if they actually have a drop in performance or not and then examining them. Um, I know that there is some impetus to actually look at the cardiological um, implications and um, on return to training, and I think that there's, there's quite a few people on the call on the call at the moment that are looking at putting some studies together. So I think this would be a fascinating area to see what their impact is on return to training. Um, so Darcy Bureau asked: Since co collegiate athletes are, have their had their se season suspended until January, and colleges won't allow them to formally train and return to campuses until the fall. What do you recommend it for athletes and teams on how to train until then? And um, certainly this has been where we have uh, been with the national level right, right up until very recently, um, where we have really tried to emphasize to them to um, A, to train on their own. Um, in, this, in some cases we've allowed them to get, we will be allowing them to get together in small groups um, to train together and to use facilities and hopefully uh, certainly as you know um, the level three and um, provinces start to open up they will be having access to gyms and other training facilities uh, outdoor basketball courts etc to get them into uh, get them into their uh, their training um, the other thing we have emphasized it, it is a good time to work on uh, areas of weakness uh, and well as their mental uh, preparation and their mental training because that's often an area that gets neglected uh, during the regular season. So, um, you know, uh, it, 
it's not an easy process, but I think that that's something that, you know, um, coaches and teams will work together to, uh, whether it's with their coach, whether a strength and conditioning coach to, uh, to keep them active and to uh, help them to go through the process. And that also, as I say, as I said before, it keeps them uh, also mentally sharper when they're, they have a training process to go through. Um, there's a question there. Some athletes test positive for COVID, COVID when they are asymptomatic. Um, in order to return them to sport, do they need to have a negative test? Um, and uh, certainly I know that in the hospital, we've had this with some individuals because what, during, especially during the lockdown, we were testing uh, every, every patient that got admitted. And we did have some patients that tested positive but really had no symptoms. And so often we would delay their surgery. Um, and uh, I must admit, towards the end, we got to the point where we were delaying surgery sometimes for three or four weeks at the detriment of the actual surgical intervention. Um, yet they didn't become negative in testing. So um, we have adjusted to that. I guess the question is, how would you, my question back would be, how would you know they tested positive and if you weren't screaming, screening asymptomatic individuals? Um, you, they would just have had it and you would never have known. But uh, I, don't, I don't know that um, I can give you a 100% answer on that. But I know that, we, uh, that sometimes people aren't becoming, they may be asymptomatic for a, a long time and that, that they still are testing positive. I don't know if you've had any experience with that, Mike, working at the uh, clinic. No, I, I, I mean, in fact, we've just been asked by the hospitals to stop routine screening of all um, surgical patients um, for the simple reason of the high number of false positives. And uh, for, for Muhammad's question, that is one of the one of the issues. Is you know, if we if we have a high number of, just hang on a sec. Um, if you have a high high percentage of false positives, the impact on on the person you're testing, the athlete, on attempting to return, is significant. And I had a discussion last night with one of the groups that were on um, that they've had a a professional league footballer in one of the international leagues that has tested positive repeatedly now over five weeks, has not been allowed to train or return to the team and has been completely asymptomatic. And they've now got some world experts in to say, well, this is a false positive. Um, so uh, again, you know, the hazards of doing mass screening on athletes is, is significant. Yeah, and thank you, Mohammed. He, uh, so the, our checking out the chat, he did say that, um, and he's 100% right, there are some organizations that, that are recommending testing of asymptomatic um, athletes uh, and, and screening of those athletes to bring them into, uh, into the training environment. So it is a risk that you, uh, you may end up causing and creating more havoc than you are planning to. Um, John Halperin, I asked if the USOC had published any guidelines um, and if they're consistent with the ones that we are referencing. And um, I know that they have uh, published guidelines. And for the ones that I've read, certainly they seem to be uh, very much in keeping with uh, the Canadian guidelines. Only ours are bitten better, of course. Um, I'm just kidding. Um, but, uh, yeah, and as well, there are obviously the Australian group has quite strong guidelines out there. Um, uh, the UK and uh, and as well as has written some very good papers on uh, their guidelines, which I think for the vast majority they're very very similar um, in the way they uh, approach things. Um, uh oh. Uh, Lee, this is a long one. Okay, I read an article that talked about those people that stay asymptomatic but test positive, i.e. people trying to come back to work. They did a study to try to grow the virus from samples in those people that kept getting positive swabs and they were not able to. They felt the PCR test had just shown dead cells, much like a urine 
chlamydia tests repeat done too soon. Wow, you're really out of my league on this one, my friend. Uh, Mike, any comments upon uh, the, uh, the negative or the continued positive tests being something like chlamydia? Yeah, there is um, <laughs> well, it's not actually chlamydia, it's, it's candidiasis is one of the things that causes a cross reaction on um, the PCR test, but that's oral yeast, Andy, just in case you're wondering. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, there, there, there certainly is some, some um, research out there and there's some references and papers out there on, on things that are causing the cross reaction. And there was a fairly large table um, that I saw in some of the testing parameters um, when we were trying to look at, at actually running tests and things. Um, I can try and big that, dig that up sometime, um, but I know that candidiasis was one of the very big ones. Okay, well, on that note, I think it's probably time for us to pack it in. I, I would like to thank Chasm. Um, I would also like to acknowledge um, all of the individuals uh, in the SMAC group that have, uh, that have and continue to contribute to um, all of the information that's put out. I will put a plug in for the next uh, SMAC update, which will be next Tuesday, which will have some of this information that we've talked about, uh, as well as some other issues um, uh, in there. And, uh, and also say that uh, thank the, uh, the, the individuals who have uh, been able to organize this for us, both Don and Helen for, uh, helping to get all of the webinars up and going and recorded and reaching a large number of individuals. So um, thanks everyone. There's some excellent questions. And uh, once again, thanks Mike for uh, doing such a great job in answering the tough questions. Thanks Andy. I know you've got control of the, of the, the button. So I'm under no illusion as to what's coming. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for putting it together. Okay. Thank you everyone.